Lando. She thought only of others and their welfare, not of herself or danger to herself. Meanwhile, the Hundred Years' War continued year after weary year. By the time Joan was 16, the war was raging even more than before. The little village where Joan lived began to know the horrors of war. They saw wrecked and smoke-blackened homes. In lanes and alleys were carcasses of dumb animals that had been slaughtered in pure wantonness. Among them calves and lambs that had been pets of the children. It was a pity to see the children lament over them. At 16, Joan was beautiful and a most attractive young lady. There was in her face a sweetness, purity, and serenity that justly reflected her spiritual nature. She was deeply religious, which made her inwardly content and joyous. If at times she showed traces of worry and pain, it came of distress for her country, France, and not of her religious or personal life showed remarkable ability to state the affairs of France in a few words. Paying taxes with milk to pay them is what the rest of France has been doing these many years. We never knew the bitterness of that before. We shall know it now. Joan became more and more concerned with the plight of France until she could think of nothing else. Whereas she had been light-hearted and merry, she now became melancholy, given to dreams and thought. She was carrying France upon her heart, and she found the burden heavy. Father, is there hope for France? No, my child. None at all. But how can you say that, Father? France will win her freedom and keep it. Do not doubt it. Joan, Joan, France is lost. France has ceased to exist. What was France is now but a British province. Isn't that true? Yes. Very well. Now, since when have French soldiers won a victory? French courage has been paralyzed. If, if 50 French soldiers were to confront five English ones, the French would run. France will rise again. You shall see. Rise? burden of English armies on her back. She will cast it off. She will trample it underfoot. Without soldiers to fight? The drums will summon soldiers. They will answer and they will march. Mm -hmm. March to the rear as usual. To the front. Ever to the front. You shall see, Father. Indeed. And who is going to perform these sublime impossibilities? God. <laughs> And then something happened that all the world has talked about, then and since. Now I'm going to let an eyewitness tell exactly what happened. He saw it. He is Louis de Conte, a childhood playmate of Joan, and later her page and secretary. It's all written in a book, Personal Recollections of Joan, available in most libraries. Listen. I was coming from over the ridge one day. It was the 15th of May. When I got to the edge of the oak forest, I happened to glance over toward the tree and saw Joan. She sat on a natural seat formed by gnarled roots of a great tree. Her head was bent a little forward, and she acted as one lost in thought, steeped in dreams not conscious of the world or of herself. Then I saw a most strange thing. A white shadow came slowly gliding along the grass toward the tree. The shadow approached Joan slowly. The extremity of it reached her, flowed over her, clothed her in its awful splendor. Presently, Joan arose and stood, with her head still bowed a little. Standing so, all drenched with that wonderful light, she seemed
seemed to be listening, but I heard nothing. After a little, she raised her head and looked up as one might look up toward the face of a giant. Then she clasped her hands and lifted them high, imploringly, and began to plead. But I am so young, too young to leave my mother and my home and go out into the strange world to undertake so great a task. How can I possibly talk with men, be comrades with men, soldiers? I stood there in awe. me over to insult and contempt. What was happening? How can I go to the great wall and lead armies? Was I having a dream? Was this real? I doubted it, for such a thing could not happen. Suddenly, Joan stopped talking. She shook with sobs. And I came to myself, believing I had just been dreaming. I carved a mark in the bark of a tree, saying to myself that I would come back later when I knew I was awake and see if the mark was still there. Then I should know if I were dreaming or not. I wondered what that form dressed in white was doing there. Joan, she's calling me. How does she know I'm here? Louis? Louis? Yes, yeah, coming. This is a part of the dream. That white thing, Joan, for calling me, all of it, just a dream. Oh, Joan, you can't imagine what happened. I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw you right where you're standing now. It's and not I... a dream. Uh, well, how did you know? Oh, don't be I... afraid, Louis. I will tell you all my secrets. But first, tell me, what was that white thing I saw? It was the shadow of an archangel, Michael, the chief and lord of the armies of heaven. Has anyone seen that white shadow but me? No one. It has fallen on me before when you and others were present, but no one could see it. Today it has been otherwise, and I was told why. But it will not be visible again to anyone. It was a sign to me? Yes. Strange that, that that dazzling light could rest on you and no one could see? And with it comes speech, too. Speech? I hear voices. I hear them, but others do not. Joan, what do they tell you? All manner of things. About France, I mean. What things? Disaster, misfortunes, and humiliations. They tell you these things beforehand? Yes, so that I know what is to happen before it happens. Just today I was told that France is about to be rescued, made free and great again. I was told that the least of God's creatures had been chosen to rescue France. You? By God's command and in his strength, I am to lead the king's armies and win back France. You? Child, a, a girl lead armies? God has enlisted me, and I will answer the call. Were you told how to become the leader of the army of France? Yes, in detail. And am I to go with you? You will march in the army with me. You and Jean and Pierre. And... Jacques? No, not Jacques. When will you leave? In the morning, before dawn. I go to speak with the governor of Vaucouleurs, who will despise me and treat me rudely. So first I go to Buris persuade my uncle Laxard to go with me. I may need you in Vaucouleur, for if the governor will not receive me, I will dictate a letter to him, and so must have someone by me who knows the art of how to write and spell the words. I will be there. Joan could have used me, a nobleman, to gain an audience with the governor. But no, she would not have it thus. What would people think? peasant girl presenting a petition through a young nobleman. I knew what I must do if I would have her approval. Go to Vaucouleur, keep out of sight, and be ready when she needed me. I went to Vaucouleur the next afternoon and took an obscure lodging. The next day, I called the castle and paid my respects to the governor who invited me to dine with him. At the appointed time, I went to the castle and was conducted to the great dining hall and seated by the side of the governor at a small table 
which was raised several feet above the general table. At this small table sat two other guests besides myself, while at the general table sat the chief officers of the garrison. Uh, I hear there's rumor to the effect that Salisbury's making preparation to march against Orleans. If this is so, uh, oh yes, it's lacking what you want. There's a young maid and a man present, sir. They wish to talk to you. Uh, who are they? A maid called Joan and her uncle Laksar. From Bure, I believe, Your Excellency. Hmm. Yeah, show, show them in. Yes, Your Excellency. A young lady and her uncle. And I wonder what they want with me. Certainly. Ooh, there they are. <laughs> and I say that maid is beautiful. Yeah, so young, though, very young. Yeah. Uh, my child, uh, what is it you want? My message is for you, and it is this. Send and tell the Dauphin to wait and not give battle to his enemies, for God will presently send him help. <laughs> what a strange thing for a young lady to say. <laughs> you must be demented. That is the message I was to give you. Oh, what nonsense. Uh, the king, or Dauphin, as you call him, needs no message to wait. Yeah. He will wait. Have no fear of that. Now, is that all you wish to say to me? I beg of you, sir, to give me an escort of men-at-arms and send them with me to the Dauphin. To the king? Oh, what for? That he may make me his general, for it is appointed that I shall drive the English out of France. Oh, ah, you? You? A girl? A child? Nevertheless, I am appointed to do it. Oh, hark ye, of you there. You are this young child's uncle? Yes, Your Excellency. Well, take her home and whip her soundly. <laughs> that is the best cure for her kind of madness. Yes, sir. Come along, Joan. My lord has commanded it so. I shall come to you again and again. And finally, I shall have the men at all. Oh, I would know. <laughs> home to our village, Joan and I. Uncle Laxar went to his home in Beret, but soon showed up in Dorimi to apologize to Joan and offer his future services. Months slipped by. Finally, on the 5th of January, 1429, Joan came to me with her uncle Laxar. The time is come, Louis. My voice has bade me to go again and see the governor. In two months, I shall be with the king. I believe it, Joan. Louis, when we were at the governor's castle before, you sat at table with the governor and two cavaliers. Who were they? <laughs> ah, my dear Joan, your perception is keen. They were good men, knights both. One was Sir Jean de Noble Pont de Metz. The other was Sir Bertrand de Poulany. Good men indeed. I marked them for followers of mine. But now to matters at hand. We will leave in the morning for the governor's palace. In high hopes, Joan again confronted the governor. But as before, he refused to send her to the king. Days passed. Joan, impatient to be seeing the king, again presented herself to the governor. You are too slow about sending me to the king, and thereby have caused great damage. I have caused damage by refusing to send you to the king? Yes, sir. This very day the king's cause has lost battle near Orléans and will suffer yet greater injury if you do not send me to him soon. Today, child? Today? Oh, how can you know what has happened in Orléans today? It would take eight or ten days to receive word from there. A voice related it to me, and it is true. A battle was lost today, and you are at fault to delay me so. Um, hark ye, go in peace and wait. If it shall turn out as you say, if a battle was lost today in Orléans, then I shall give you a letter to the king as you request. In nine days you will fetch me the letter. <laughs> called this council of war to tell you that we leave for the king's palace on the 23rd at 11 o'clock at night. 
You will be prepared to march at night and sleep in the daytime, for we shall pass through enemy territory. Remember and be ready. 11 o'clock at night on the 23rd. You heard her, men. We leave on the 23rd. Even if the governor does write the letter, he still may not do it in time to meet the date she has chosen. How can she venture to name a specific date? We must trust her. We shall do good to obey her. All day on the 23rd, Joan was nervous, glancing up whenever strange sounds were heard. At nightfall, the governor had not sent the promised letter. We leave at 11. The letter will be here. It was so. At 10, the governor came, with his guard and torchbearers, and delivered to her a mounted escort with horses and equipment for me, and gave Joan a letter to the king. Then he took off his sword and belted it around Joan's waist with his own hands. You spoke the truth, my child. The battle was lost on the day you said. So I have kept my word. Now, go. Come of it what may. At 11, we began the long, dangerous journey to the royal castle of Chinon. At Jean, in friendly territory, we rested. And it was here Joan dictated a letter to the king, which I spelled out and wrote. My king, I have come 150 leagues to deliver unto you good news. I beg the privilege of delivering it to you in person. I have never seen you, my king, yet I would know you in any disguise under any circumstances. Your faithful servant, Joe. Days passed into weeks, and still we remained in our modest inn, awaiting word from the king. Finally, the innkeeper burst in upon us, ranting and raving with excitement. Downstairs, there is a commission of illustrious ecclesiastics from the king. They wish to see you, little maid. They're from the king himself. Think of this vast honor to this humble hostelry. Come, come, let the commission enter and have their say. Then he flew downstairs and presently appeared again, backing into the room and bowing to the ground with every step in front of four imposing and austere bishops and their train of servants. We, we are astonished, to say the least, at the youthfulness of one who has made such a noise in the world. Now then, we understand that you have a message for the king. You put the message into it, child, and give it to us that uh, we may bring it to the king. You will forgive me, reverend sirs, but I have no message save for the king's ear alone. Huh. Do you fling the king's command in his face and refuse to deliver the message to his approved servants? God has appointed the king himself to receive it. I beg of you, permit me to have speech with the king. Oh, stop this folly. Come, give us the message and waste no more time about it. I have no message save for the king himself. Come, come, gentlemen, enough of this child and her folly. Let us be gone back to the king. Joan, why did you pass up this chance to get your message to the king? Who sent them here? The king? Who advised the king to send them? The king's council. Are they enemies of my mission or friends? Enemies. Well, does one choose traitors and enemies by which to send important messages? As usual, Joan, you are right. We are dull-witted and wrong. The king will see me. Have no fear. days poked along. Then one day, great news came. The king had been persuaded to see Joan. At the appointed time, the Count of Vendôme came richly clothed with his train of servants and assistants to conduct Joan to the king. I went along, being entitled to this privilege by reason of my official position near her person. was filled to overflowing with nobles and high officers of the court. All were awed and amazed at the youthfulness and beauty of Joan, who walked two yards behind the count. I walked two yards behind Joan. Our solemn march ended when we were some eight to ten feet from the throne. 
The Count made a deep obeisance, pronounced Joan's name, then bowed again and moved to his place among a group of officials near the throne. I, too, moved slightly away. All eyes were fixed on Joan. Amazingly, she made no obeisance, but stood looking toward the throne in silence. I looked at the throne and suddenly realized that a trick had been played upon Joan. It was not the king sitting on the throne. They had taken advantage of the hint in her letter that she would know the king in any disguise and under any circumstances and had set this trap for her. She would err and they would laugh at her. I glanced at Joan. She was turning her head slowly, her eye wandering along the line of standing courtiers until it fell upon a young man who was very quietly dressed. Her face lighted with joy, and she ran and threw herself at his feet. Oh, Your Majesty, may God give grace to you and long life. You are mistaken, my child. I am not the king. He sits there on the throne. No, gracious Majesty, you are the king and none other. More important, who are you and what would you have? I am called Joan the Maid. I am sent to say that the King of Heaven wills that you be crowned as Lieutenant of the Lord of Heaven, who is King of France. God also willeth that you set me at my appointed work and give me men at arms. For then will I raise the siege of Orléans and break the English power. <laughs> you are requesting that I appoint you General of my armies. The Lord of Heaven wills it, my King. Joan conversed for some little while. Then the king escorted us personally to the very door of the audience hall, an honor seldom given to any personage regardless of how important. And we were light-hearted and happy, believing that the king would hastily do Joan's bidding and give her command of the royal troops. But we were doomed to tedious waits and delays until finally we were about to give up in despair. Delays were due, in part, to some of the king's advisers who suggested that perhaps Joan was of Satan, not God. A long inquisition followed, conducted by a committee of bishops. They came daily and questioned Joan, but to no avail. The inn, during the next few weeks, became a dreary place of weary waiting. We must be patient. The Lord will have his way in good season. In the meantime, I am weary of delays. The king surely must find Listen. out. Listen, it's in the street. Trumpets. Yes, it sounds like the king's signal of proclamation. Oh, it is. It's the king's own herald at arms about to deliver a proclamation. Oh, open the window. Let's hear it. Joan of Arc, a peasant girl, was made general of all the armies of France when she was but 17 years of age. It is the fanfare of the king's personal messenger about to make a proclamation. Open the window that we may hear the proclamation. Though so all men undertake he therefore that the Most High and the Most Illustrious Charles, by the grace of God, King of France, had been pleased to confer upon his well-beloved servant, Joan of Arc, called the Maid, 
the title, authority, and dignity of General-in-Chief of all the armies of France. <laughs> Joan, your dreams and ambitions are now... Close the window. We have much work to do. But you are now General of all France's forces. Congratulations. It is God's will, not mine. Nevertheless, I do thank you, all of you, for remaining true to the cause for which I am appointed. Uncle Laxar, you have been very useful and kind to me. Louis, I need not say how valuable you have been to me and to the cause. Sieur Jean de novelle you and Sieur Bertrand de Poulangy, both knights of His Majesty's court, have been invaluable and have given the cause dignity and direction. Even you, Paladin, have had your worth. In the name of God, King of Heaven, and of France, thank you. And now, good night. I shall see you all bright and early on the morrow. My first official act as Commander-in-Chief is to send an official communication to the English commanders at Orléans, asking them to depart from France. Louis, you will take this down, write it upon parchment, and send it by messenger to Orléans, requesting an immediate reply. Yes, General. Duke of Bedford, who call yourself Regent of France, William de la Pole, Earl of Suffolk, and you, Thomas Lord Scales, who style yourselves Lieutenants of Bedford, render to the maid who is sent by God the keys of all the good towns you have taken and violated in France. Be gone into your own land, for wherever I find your people in France, I shall drive them. You may come forward, maid. My Charles, Lieutenant of God, King of France, long life. Be seated, please. I asked you here, maid, to acquaint you with my orders. First of all, I have appointed one of my own royal family to be your chief of staff. Next, I give you Doulon, a faithful and veteran officer to be chief of your household. Now, beyond these two appointments, you yourself shall choose your other officers. My king is generous and very kind. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh... Uh, by the way, maid, uh, one of my nephews asked uh, to be appointed as your standard bearer. Uh, is that possible? Is that a command, your majesty? <laughs> I see you have a, a mind of your own. Uh, I approve. You name your own standard bearer without regard to those of my court who are uh, clamoring for a place in your headquarters organizations. <laughs> De Poulangy, order Blois to be made into the recruiting station and depot of supplies. Order General Lahir from the front to take charge. Yes, Your Excellency. Louis. Yes, Your Excellency. There is a painter in tour named James Powers. Get him. I want him to paint my standard. Yes, Your Excellency. Send for me, Your Excellency. Yes, de Metz. I want you to go to Fierbois and get me a special sword that rests behind the altar at St. Catherine. Right away, Your Excellency. But there is no sword here. You can see for yourself. Your Excellency said there is. She's mistaken. The maid is never mistaken. She said there'd be a sword. Back of the altar? Back of the altar, she said. So it must be there. Not unless it's buried in the ground. Anyway, I do not see how Her Excellency, the maid, would know if there's a sword here or if there is not. It must be buried. Shall we dig and see? As you wish. Men, uh, dig here. Are you sure there's no sword here? I've been in this place for years, and I've never heard of a sword. Your maid. Oh, there it is. A sword. Oh, so it is. Now, how did your maid know of this? Uh, uh, give me the sword. 
wonder who this sword belongs to. Isn't this the place Charlemagne once spent several weeks? Yes, 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 it is. Perhaps the sword belonged to him. Well, right now it belongs to Her Excellency, the maid. So give it to me that I may take it to her. Oh, it is without a sheath. It's dirty and rusty. I shall clean and polish it. Also, have the good priests make a sheath of crimson velvet. Then shall I send you on your way with it to tour. Why are you so gloomy and downhearted, Paladin? Usually you're cheerful and bright. Why? The whole tour is happy and gay. Songs and shoutings fill the air. Throngs crowd the inns and streets. Everyone carries a glad and cheerful face. All except you. Why? I'm no good. <laughs> oh, the great Paladin admitting he's no good. Imagine. <laughs> What's to become of me? All my life, even as a boy, I've been nothing but a bragging idiot. And now Jones, the general of France's armies. And me? <laughs> what am I? Nothing. I'm not even very liable to be appointed to any position in Joan's household, not even her general flunky. Well, for that matter, what chance of any of us youngsters? She's overrun with applicants. Most of the applicants are backed by great names and weighty influence. Mm -hmm. What have I got to recommend me? Nothing. Joan could and probably will fill even the most humble places in her household with the titled folk. Such folk would be a bulwark for her and a valuable support at all times. Yes. Furthermore, policy won't let her appoint any of us to her household. We simply do not have a chance. I suspect you're right. For once. Huh? I'll get it. Yes? Dolon sent me. You and the others are requested to be at Her Excellency's court at once. Thank you. Well, what did I tell you? Joan's going to appoint Dolon to a high place in her household, and he wants us there to do him homage. Perhaps. Even so, we must present ourselves to Her Excellency as ordered. Oh, not me. She hardly knows I exist. Never has. Oh, do not be so bitter. It doesn't become you. Bitter? No, I'm not bitter. For once in my life, I'm facing up to facts, that's all. I've always been a talker, not a doer. Joan sees right through me. She knows I'm a coward at heart. No good, harsh-spoken idiot. Oh, come on, go along. I'm sure Joan doesn't feel all that badly about you. Well, I'm not going. But I will notify the others while you get dressed. All right. Greetings, Your Excellency. Greetings, my friends, all of you. Oh, it does my heart good to see my childhood friends around me. And I'm going to appoint all of you to places in my household. I want all of you by my side. Dolon? Yes, General? Have each step forward in his turn and receive warrants as I instructed you. Yes, General. Uh, will the two knights, Jean de Novelampon and Bertrand de Pourangy, please step forward? By order of Joan, known as the maid, General of all the armies of France. Next I below the two knights one. stood Joan's two brothers. I was appointed first page and secretary. Noel became Joan's private messenger. He also appointed a second page, two heralds, a chaplain and almoner, a maitre d'hôtel, and several domestics. Then she looked around. Well, where is Paladin? Louis, do you know where Paladin is? They thought he was not sent for, Your Excellency. But of course I intended him to come also. Let him be called at once. Paladin entered humbly, but ventured no farther than just inside the door. He stopped there, embarrassed. Come on in, Paladin. Up here by me. Why are you afraid of me, Paladin? We were childhood playmates, remember? I, I'm not afraid, Your Excellency. Then you've lost your tongue. And you used to have such a glib tongue. Oh, yes, Your Excellency. That's just the point. I'm a braggart. I'm not quality like the rest of you. Never have been. Would you follow me where I lead? Anywhere? Everywhere? 
Into the fire, Your Excellency. I believe you, Paladin. Here, take this. Your, your standard? My standard. You shall be my standard bearer. You will ride with me in every battle, by my side in all marches. Everywhere I go, you shall be by my side, bearing my standard. If I ever disgrace this trust, Your Excellency, my comrades will know how to do a friend's office upon my body. And this charge I lay upon them, knowing they will not fail. On the way back to the inn, Paladin, Louis, and the rest of them were silent, knowing not how to express their mixed emotions. Paladin was the first to give vent to his surprise and elation. Standard bearer, me. I'm Her Excellency's standard bearer. Think of it, me. <laughs> it is the highest honor that could have been paid you. Oh. Sons of two dukes tried to get to be her standard bearer. Yeah. And I got it. Me, Paladin. And you claimed you were a coward. <sighs> but actually, you are brave. You've been appointed to the most dangerous place in all the army. I was a coward, but Her Excellency said I was brave, and I am. Her saying so made it. Yes, yes, that's it. France, too, was cowed and a coward. But Joan spoke, and now France marches with her head held high. A miracle of The young men, those who had come from Dorame with Joan, none of them were past 19, and they were totally without battle experience, were now supplied with uniforms and armor. They were indeed beautiful to look upon, whether clothed for peace or for war. Clothed for peace in costly stuffs and rich colors, they were dyed with the glories of sunset, plumed and sashed ironclad for war. Joan issued orders for the march to Blois. It was a beautiful, clear, and sharp morning. The company rode in twos, side by side. Joan and the Duke of Alessand came first, followed by Lon and Paladin, the standard bearer. All in all, it was a handsome spectacle as Joan bowed her plumed head from side to side, and the sun glinted on her silver mail, the crowd of spectators cheered wildly. <laughs> the first war march of Joan of Arc was begun. Well, we made quite a show marching out of town. People loved it. I'm wondering how we'll do an actual battle. Oh, there's magic about Joan that touches all who come in contact with her. We'll win. <laughs> oh, something tickling your funny boat? Yes, Lahir. Lahir? <laughs> General Lahir. Lahir is not to be laughed at. Oh, indeed he isn't. To laugh at him is to sign your own death warrant. Big and blustery. Achieves discipline by his fists. <laughs> Can't you see the humor of it when Lahir and Joan meet? Now, they're exact opposites. One large and ugly. The other small and beautiful. One winning her way by smiles and sweetness. The other by the might of his fists and loudness of his curses. <laughs> I tell you, it's going to be a circus to watch those two when they meet. Which will win? Which will be master? Which will become the servant? You know, it's said that Lahir has yet to find his match. He refuses even to obey the orders of the king himself. The only reason he remains a general is because he wins battles and makes soldiers out of raw recruits. <laughs> And I think he'll have found his match in Joan. The irresistible power meeting the immovable object. <laughs> Arriving in Blois, Joan and her officers set up headquarters near the camp storehouse. There was no more order in that camp than there is among the wolves and hyenas. 
The men went about roaring and drinking, whooping, shouting, swearing, and entertaining themselves with all manner of rude and riotous horseplay. It was in the midst of all this that Palatin and Louis had their first glimpse of General Lahir. <laughs> Louis. Louis, he's the largest man I ever saw. With that mail from head to toe and that helmet with its bushel of swishing plumes, he looks even bigger. Look, look at that huge sword. Well, weigh me down. <laughs> Listen at him, will you? Now get it through your thick skulls, you imbeciles. I'm going to pay my respects to our new general, and I will not have disorder. What will the lady think if she sees all this confusion and byplay? Kiss the general for me, will you, liar? <laughs> oh. Now, carry him back to his tent. And let that be a lesson to the rest of you. The maid is coming to camp, and I will not have the head of this army exposed to this sort of spectacle. <laughs> oh, Her Excellency will be impressed with me. <laughs> A woman in charge of all the French armies. What a revolting idea. But I'll know how to handle her. I'll have her eating out of my hands in no time at all. <laughs> Joan's military family of six, the great chiefs of the army, including the Lord High Admiral, was prepared to meet the renowned La Hare. When he entered, one could see the surprise in his face at Joan's beauty and extreme youth. Lahir bowed low with his helmet in his gauntleted hand and made a bluff but handsome little speech with hardly an oath in it. And one could see that those two, Joan and Lahir, took to each other on the spot. The ceremonies were soon ended, and all but Lahir went away. He and Joan sat there and talked and laughed together like old friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, General Lahir, I presume we should get down to business. Business, Your Excellency? Why, what possible business can such a charming and beautiful woman as you have? I shall issue some orders, General. Oh, orders? <laughs> First, I want it understood that every loose woman in the camp must leave immediately. <laughs> Secondly, the carousing must stop. <laughs> Drinking must be brought under control. Well, uh, Discipline will replace disorder. <laughs> Furthermore, all recruits must be present at divine services. <laughs> but, but my men? General, <laughs> those are orders. Carry them out to the letter. Oh, these men of mine? Attend church? Oh, my dear general, they'll see us both in fire first. My general, this is an army, not, not a woman's society. If I tell them to go to church, they'll think that I... <laughs> well, how can we win any battles if my men are in church and I... Oh, you've changed your mind, little maid. <laughs> On the contrary, my general. You will obey my orders as I gave them. All right, all right. Hear your orders and I shall obey them as best I can. And furthermore, general, I have a personal order for you. Eh? I order you to stop swearing. No more cursing or swearing. Well, that's impossible. I, I, I can't. Why, that's my native tongue. I can no more stop swearing than I, than I can stop breathing. I implore you, Your No Excellency. more I... swearing, General. Hmm. All right, all right, men. Quiet down. Quiet, quiet. I've just come back from the commander in chief's headquarters. And there are going to be some dangers made. Right now, right now, understand? Now, now, you new recruits. You're to attend religious service regularly. <laughs> quiet, quiet, I'll have your heads. But the general, sure you don't expect soldiers. And what do you think this camp is? A place of entertainment? This is a military camp, and don't forget it. Now, I want obedience, get me? And that's an order. The first one who gets out of line will feel the force of this. Joan of Arc and 
General Lahir became inseparable. They rode back and forth through the camp, inspecting, perfecting, observing. They rode side by side. Three days after arriving in the recruiting camp of Blois, Joan and the newly disciplined army moved out, marching toward the beleaguered city of Orléans. It was eight o'clock one evening when Joan and her army rode through the Burgundy Gate into Orléans. The people had heard of this little maid and her recent appointment as the commander-in-chief of the army of France, and they pressed forward to catch a glimpse of her. She's smiling, see? She's taking her place. She's patting that woman on the head with her gauntlet. Isn't she lovely? Long live her One evening, when Louis was on duty at headquarters, the door burst open and in rushed Paladin. Louis! Louis, I wish to speak to Joan at once. You know, I can't let you disturb her unless it's urgent. But it is urgent, most urgent. Ah, you've discovered a new inn and eating place, perhaps? Oh, I've uncovered an English plot against our army. You're sure of this? Positive. Then I'm sure Her Excellency will wish to speak with you. Follow me. <laughs> Covered a plot against our army? Yes, the army under the command of Dunois. He's even now approaching Orléans. I know. Well, I, I talked to a deserter named Augustine. He said that the English planned to send a strong detachment of soldiers to this side of the river under cover of darkness and spring on Dunois as he passes the Bastille. Uh, Dunois and his men are able to withstand such an attack? No, Your Excellency. Unless you are present, the French army will do as they have for the past several years. When they see the English army, they'll turn and run. Well done, Paladin. I shall make a personal report to the king about this. Thank you, Excellency. Louis, summon Jean de Metz. Have him order La Hire, de Villard, and Florent to report to me at five tomorrow morning sharp, with 500 picked men well mounted. <laughs> We should be encountering Dunois and his regiment any time now. The report was that we should meet him about three leagues from the city, and we... Hey, an army ahead, coming in this direction. It's Dunois, Excellency. We will wait their coming here. When they arrive, bring Dunois to me immediately. Yes, Excellency. presence has already done miracles for my men, Your Excellency. They were restive and uneasy the nearer we got to the dreaded Bastilles. Now they're calm, strong, brave. Then we shall resume the march. Orléans awaits. Oh, Your Excellency, I beg of you, remain here. Let my men pass in review before you. Then they can know that the report of your presence was not merely a ruse to revive their courage. All right. My staff and I will remain here. Parade your men. Oh, thank you, Your Excellency. Isn't she beautiful today? She doesn't look a day over 15. Is she watching the parade of men in arms? Pelada, that wagon laden with supplies, do you see a man on top of it, lying on his back? Uh, yes, Your Excellency. Well, it, it looks as if he's tied hand and foot with strong rope. So he is, Your Excellency. Signal that officer in charge of the division to drop out and report here to me. Yes, Excellency. Captain Fairbanks reporting to the general, sir. Oh, uh, madam. You're in charge of that division? Yes, my general. That man on top of those supplies, why is he bound like that? He is a prisoner, general. An English prisoner of war? No, general. One of our own men, a deserter. Oh. Well, what is to be done with him? He will be hanged, General. Uh, but it was not convenient to do it before we left, so we'll do it this evening. A deserter, you said. Bring the man to me.
This is the deserter, General. What is your name? They call me the Dwarf. Raise up your head and look this way when you speak to me. Now, lift up your hands. I shall cut the bonds. But, General, the man is under sentence. There, Dwarf. The ropes that bound you are cut. And I... Why, your wrists are bleeding. I do not like this, Captain. Give me some cloth with which to bandage these wrists. Yes, General. While we're waiting to bandage your wrists, you can tell me more about yourself. Why do they call you the Dwarf? You're anything but small. In fact, you're just about the largest man I've ever seen. They call me the Dwarf in jest, I think. Tell me, soldier, what is it you have done? Tell me all. It was this way, Your Excellency. My mother died, and my three little children. All in the space of two years, it was a famine. Then word came that my poor wife was dying. I begged for leave to go to her. She was so dear to me. She, she was all I had. I pled on my knees. But they wouldn't let me go. Could I let her die alone and friendless? Would she let me die and she not come? Oh, she'd come. She would come come through fire if necessary. So I, I disobeyed orders and went to her. She, she died in my arms. I buried her. By that time, the army was gone. I, I had difficulty overtaking it. It was only last night I overtook it. Look straight at me. I would see your eyes. I believe you. You are pardoned. Just continue to be a good soldier for France. But did you not know it would mean death to come back to the army? Yes, I knew it. Then why did you do it? Because it means death. She was all I had. There's nothing left to live for, to love. Oh, yes, there is, dwarf. There is France. The children of France always have her to love. You shall live. You shall serve your country. I shall serve you. You shall fight for France. You shall be a soldier of France. Would you like to be my man at arms? Orderly? Sentinel? If I may. You may. Then I shall serve you well and good. I shall protect you as I would my own children. I shall serve you and my country. And so ends another chapter in our story of the girl general. She was a peasant girl, unlettered and poor in a world of pomp and power. But Joan of Arc had faith. That faith was a candle in the dark, a fire that melted fear, transformed doubt into doing, and defeat into victory. So much is possible with faith. So little is ever achieved without it.